Okay, so if you're feeling like Sora AI is going to take away your job, you're not alone. We are only moments away from being able to create any video our mind can imagine with just a text prompt. Editors in my Discord are already asking, what's the point in doing this? People won't value my work when they can press a button and get a video. But for a lot of us, the issue isn't that AI is taking over, it's that we're not taking advantage of this industry shift and getting ahead. Now, this isn't the first time industries have had major technology disruptions putting thousands of people out of work, but there are always those that not only survive the change, they make more money than they ever did before. And I wanted to talk about this as I've been using AI profitably in my video production company for the last two years. So I wanted to start this video by reacting to Marquez Brownlee's video as he gives a really fantastic insight into where our industry is going. And I will follow this with some practical insights from my experience that's helped me get ahead of the curve. And so if you've fallen into this myth that it's all doom and gloom for video creators, then this video should hopefully help you better prepare yourself for our industry's impending change. Let's get started. So do you remember Will Smith eating spaghetti? Do you remember when this was what AI generated videos look like? Remember when we said, okay, this AI stuff is cool and all, but clearly there's a long way to go before there's any need for concern. Well, welcome to the future people, because this is also an AI generated video. And so is this, completely synthesized out of thin air by computers. This one too, this is not real. Absolutely ridiculous how far we've come in literally one year. So as you can see here, one of the main points coming up is how quickly this AI technology has evolved. And I think this is something worth mentioning because when we've looked at the way technology has evolved in the past before we were looking at AI models, so you know, looking at the evolutions of iPhones or video editing software, it was always sporadic and in waves, but Sora AI is fundamentally different. AI is so predictable in how it develops and grows. It's not a matter of, oh, once they figure out this little quirk and fix it, they'll be good. No, they're just gonna brute force it with data. The more videos they can feed into this program to generate videos, the more accurate it's going to get. And eventually they'll just brute force enough in and it'll just work. We can't be putting ourselves in denial as video editors and producers. This technology is evolving way too quickly to go, oh, this is five years away. Oh, that's so far away. I'm not going to worry about it now. Now is the time to worry about it because not only are we discovering this, our clients are discovering this. And look, let's be honest, if it's a video that people don't care about and they can get it generated for free versus paying someone to make the money, then they will absolutely just go for the free option. But this is where the conversation I'll be taking it later on the line is figuring out, well, what are clients still going to value when they could get a video generated for free, because even if you can get something for free, sometimes people are still gonna pay people to get things done. And that's really where I wanna take this conversation by the end, but let's get into that when that comes up. So let's keep going. This is another one which has a long prompt about a camera following behind a white vintage SUV with a black roof rack as it speeds up. A Actually, even looking at this white truck here right now, I think this is a great example of how us video producers are going to really start using this to begin with. So there's probably going to be a few phases, one where there's people get generating videos to help promote their stuff. And they're not really too worried about quality or reputation. So, you know, hey, I don't really care if I produce this video and people judge me for it. If it gets me a sale at the end of the day, I'm happy. And if I don't have to pay anyone to do this, then even better. So that kind of client, I'm actually really happy to see go. So these are the kinds of clients you see on Fiverr and Upwork, and they're really trying to get the lowest price possible. There is another industry which had these clients disappear and it really improved them. And I'm talking about graphic design. There's a program that came out called Canva. You're probably familiar, or if you're not, it's basically the user-friendly version of Photoshop. And what ended up happening when Canva came out is that graphic designers didn't lose their work. No, it's just the bottom tier disappeared. So anyone who was doing these really quick, really cheap graphic designs for clients, their work basically disappeared when Canva came up because Canva allowed these business owners or people to create stuff on the cheap really quickly. It was cheaper and quicker for them to go on Canva and make it themselves than go to a graphic designer to make up something for them really quickly. But what ended up happening is that graphic designers as a whole really focused more on finding higher quality clients that wanted someone to take responsibility for the project, which again, we'll dive deeper into what that responsibility means as we keep going. But cutting back to this shot here, I think phase two is going to be when we start seeing a lot of video producers, editors, directors, we start using AI plus touch up tools. Let's just say this shot here was actually being used for a car commercial. Well, there's always going to be these little micro details wrong with the car itself. And 
when you're doing any sort of product video, it's absolutely important that you get every single detail right. So then basically a compositor would probably come in here and rotoscope out the car, make it disappear, and then re-add back in a 3D model of the car they do want to use, and then probably even use AI to kind of just stitch everything up together so it blends a bit better. That would definitely be a future I could see happening in the next six months to two years. Here's another one. A litter of golden retriever puppies playing in the snow. Their heads pop in and out of the snow, covered in it. It's so good. It feels like the physics of the fur and the ears and everything with the snow flying around in slow motion is incredible. That's actually the most insane. When I look back at this dog video, just the textures and the fluffiness and the floatiness of it all is absolutely insane. And I think this is probably going to be one of the first cases we see is using AI to create feeling. So if we're looking to create these accurate representations of products or some sort of specific location, AI is not going to get all the details right for it to pass. But if we want to create these moments that invoke an emotion, we're already there. We can already use this. If we're trying to create a, I don't know, let's just say a pillow commercial, this is a great shot. Like this is how fluffy our pillows feel is a bunch of puppies playing in some cloudy snow. Like I would absolutely, as a client, be like, absolutely throw that in there. Let's get that feeling across. So I think that's definitely going to be where we start seeing this in the earliest phases as us professionals integrating it into our own kind of commercial work, I guess you could say. I've actually already experienced this myself as well. So when I tried to create, recreate, I guess you could say, historical moments or moments that actually existed in real life, we never ended up passing them on the editing floor because... It felt like we're trying to trick you to think, hey, this fake moment actually existed. It's never really worked in terms of perception, I guess you could say. But in saying that, we have used AI for telling hypothetical things. So if we're saying like, hey, here's a hypothetical story about X, Y, Z, then yeah, we would actually create some AI images and generate them in there just to give some visuals to this hypothetical situation. And because there was the context like this moment doesn't actually exist, we're just playing in our minds, people were much more receptive to it being AI content. Honestly, if I saw this on Twitter, I wouldn't even think twice. I'd be like, oh, nice drone shot, dude. Wouldn't even think about AI if I wasn't pixel peeping at like the way the water was moving. Like this, this is a totally usable video in an ad for some California based product <laughs> and that. So yeah, I think that's exactly what he's nailed it, right? So like, again, like this footage here, if you AI generated this, it takes away a job from a drone videographer. And if you look at it from a customer's perspective, they're getting almost an identical shot. The only people that are going to notice are the pixel peepers, as Mark Hayes has said so eloquently there. As a video producer, you could have these two video producers, and let's just say they're both offering the same price, but one's going to use real drone footage and the other one's going to use AI generated footage. You're going to get two completely different offers. And for the customer, they're going to feel very different. So the drone footage person is going to be like, yep, I can get this done. It's going to take a little bit longer because we need to go out, get the drone footage, come back and then really start working it all together. But you're going to have this really realistic scene. And even if you pixel peep, people are going to know it's real footage or you're going to have the person who comes in and they're going to offer the AI drone shot. They're going to go, great, you know what, we're going to get you 10 versions of this drone shot. We're going to be able to pick out and design the best one from it. We're going to be able to do it in a couple hours. It's got nothing to do with the fact of whether it's real or not. It's just like the ability to be able to produce content that's one, the same level of quality, two, at a much quicker rate, and three, with many more variations. It allows for a lot more creative control and freedom from the customer's perspective. And I think that's really why AI is going to win. It's not about us and you know how proud we are that we can do these crafts it's about delivering that customer experience in a way that they appreciate and i think again if we were to let go of the ego of like our job is precious and i know that sounds really controversial and but that's probably one of the biggest things i think that puts people in threat of not having a sustainable career as they move forward is that they keep looking at all the effort and skill they put into the past to be able to do this skill is now being completely undervalued by new technology. Unfortunately, that's the way things go in this world. And I think a really good example that is, illustrates this is looking back at how 
the farmers were affected when tractors were invented. There isn't really any official data on how many farmers lost their jobs due to tractors, but let's just run through a hypothetical. So let's just say 90% of people were farmers before tractors existed. And then once tractors got into the scene and it became adopted, we went from 90% to 10% of the world became farmers. The reason why I bring this up is to go, well, let's just say that if we went from 90% of people being farmers to 10%, but of that 10%, they're making twice as much money, was tractors a good thing for the farming industry as a whole? See, that's the kind of the interesting debate that comes up a lot is that, well, if there's going to be less room for us creators to be out there, but of us that exist, we make more money, is that something we should be excited about? For me personally, I am. I do really care and feel for people that struggle to make it into this industry. It is already tough enough as it is. But again, it's just kind of the way this world works. We live in a capitalistic society where you look at a problem that needs to be solved and you get paid for solving that problem. There isn't, unfortunately, a lot of support for saying, hey, well, you love what you're doing. Let's help you do it. That's just not how the world works. Looking back at this, we can see that the drone flyer is going to lose his job, but the production company is going to make more money because again, they're not having to pay for it. They're able to give a better quality experience to the clients. They might even be able to charge more for it as well. Is that good or bad isn't really the right question to be asking. It's just, are we ready for that change? And so I think one of the questions coming up and you're seeing this commonality happening is that the more you're in the bricklaying or the getting the job done so the job gets done, the more you're at risk. And the closer you are to being in charge of the whole project, designing it, ensuring that it's going to be satisfying to the client, the better off you're going to be. So the question becomes, well, if you're here, how do we move here? And I think a lot of people build up this fear, at least from what I'm seeing in the video editing world, because they're going like, oh, well, it's just going to go to all the agencies and the big producers. And so all the companies are going to make all this money and all the people creating the work are going to suffer. Yeah, I think that could be a case as well. But I don't think that means you have to be there. So thankfully, in tandem with AI technology, we're seeing a much more global market. So, you know, we're seeing social media being used to promote people all around the world to anyone around the world and a lot of other things as well related to the Internet. This means something very specific because it used to be back in the day, you'd have to go to an agency and that's all you could go to or you could go to a local company and they kind of did everything. What's evolving now and you probably heard this a million times already, the niching down, basically finding out a common problem that the world has like, oh, I can see that a lot of people need testimonial videos. I'm going to do just testimonial videos. Or I see that there are a lot of businesses wanting to start an Instagram account. I'm going to do just Instagram photos and videos, something like that, basically. And a lot of companies don't want to go to these big agencies and they don't want to go to a generalist. They want to pay uh, enough money to someone to take responsibility for solving that problem. One of those things we want to be looking at is stop having such admiration for our ability to craft something and start looking at how we can solve problems and bigger problems for clients. If your love for what you can create with your hands gets in the way of that, then that's no longer becoming a love or a passion. That's your ego getting in the way of your client. And this obviously brings up another debate, which we won't get too deep into, which is art and design. So artists create things to express themselves and designers create things to express others. And if you're an artist, all this AI technology is getting in the way of people appreciating the talent you've had. And I do have full sympathy for you. That really does suck because as an artist, it's just becoming harder to express yourself because the world's becoming so noisy with all this machine generated content that does make people feel things as well. It's quite insulting if I had to be honest. But then designers, on the other hand, it's not about how we create things. It's about being in service of someone else. So that does mean taking away our egos and just being like, yep, this is who we're going to serve. I do think they're going to have to be very careful with this. They're, they're going to have a whole bunch of safety stuff to keep in mind. I think they'll probably have to be even more safe than Dolly. So I think what Marquez brings up here is actually a really good indicator for the future of our industry. With the advent of AI coming out, anyone can say anything about everything and sound convincing. That's really dangerous because realistically, you know, you don't want someone giving financial advice if they're really young and haven't gone through the pains themselves, had the proper and official education and licensing, yet anyone will be able to make themselves sound like a financial advisor with the use of AI, 
really convincingly. And that in itself is extremely dangerous, as well as all the other deep faking going on. What this means is that we're going to be seeing heavier adoptions into personal branding. So I think what's going to happen is it's no longer going to be about finding the information for what you're looking for. It will all be out there. It will be about finding the information from someone you can trust. And really, I think that's where a lot of this AI technology is going. AI is really good at saying anything and everything, but it doesn't mean it's right. And if it's wrong, it's not going to take responsibility. It can do anything quicker than any human can, but it has no responsibility for what it says versus you bring an expert in, they will take responsibility and they will make sure that the decisions made are the right decisions. So when you combine AI with the right expert, you basically get a new level of productivity that we haven't really seen before. And that's what we're already seeing with a lot of industries right now. So I think a lot of this future is going to come down to becoming the expert people want to hire for the reliability, the safety net. And most, most importantly, I think the key word we're looking for here is that people will hire people in the future to take on the responsibility of the job. It's no longer going to be hiring someone because I can't do it. I'm going to hire someone because I don't want to do it. I don't want to be responsible for it. So you understand the concepts and insights to where our career is going, but what are the actions you need to take to get ahead of the curve and be in this industry as we start shifting? And there's two things I've really taken on board that's helped me evolve without feeling like I've lost my identity in the process. And the first problem we need to overcome is people valuing our work. How do we charge for something when customers can get it for free? Everything in business is supply and demand. Take editing short form videos, for example. This is one of the most oversupplied niches to try and get into. Not only is there an army of editors coming out and jumping on this trend that's been happening for two years, but with technology like CapCut, Bob the Builder can download an app and skip the editors all themselves and film himself putting up a fence. Bob becomes his own supplier for video. If it takes him 30 minutes to make a short, then he's only going to value a short at most 30 minutes worth of his time. So action one you need to do is focusing on the problem you're solving, not the skills in your craft. As AI gets better, they'll keep taking high level skills and automating them with machines. This isn't just an oversupply, it's an infinite supply. But if we focus on the problem instead of the talent, we're no longer going to go to Bob, I'll make X shorts per week. The conversation evolves into, I will help grow your social channel. I'll be there to create for you, learn what works and adjust until we get desired results. AI will not take responsibility for what it does, but you can. There is always a demand for responsibility. And as far as we can tell, there isn't a way to create an infinite supply of it. So we understand that we need to provide something that cannot be infinitely copied, but without knowing how to strategically adopt new technology, you'll still be pushed out of this industry. And I'll give you an example. We're gonna take it back to farming. So my dad's been farming for over 40 years. And even if he only had horses and you had all the machines, you wouldn't outcompete him if you've just lived your whole life in the city. And I'm not trying to say this is some kind of egotistical like, yeah, he's so great kind of thing. It's just what would practically happen. And here's why. If you were to do one of the jobs that machines do, such as building a farm roadway, if it's one degree slanted this way, the slickness of the road pulls the water down, meaning that this side of the road becomes flooded and then this side of the road becomes a barren desert. Or in simple terms, you destroy the land and go broke. So a city slicker can't come in with a machine and beat him, but another farmer with the machine absolutely would if he didn't have a strategic attitude towards change. And this concept applies to you as well. From doing the work, you understand what videos produce results and especially what will cause damage. If some random Joe Blow comes in and tries creating all the videos, they can cause irreparable damage to their brand just like the roadway. But this doesn't mean we can go, oh yeah, we're okay then. Whether it's my dad or you, you have to be adopting technology early because it takes time to implement. Many video creators try new technology, get their first result and go, ah, this sucks and throw it in the bin. This is just like trying to create a road, destroying the land and going, oh, this doesn't work. Others will come in and figure out how to make it work. So action two is just buy the fucking tractor. Just start using AI. So many creators make excuses like, oh, it's not perfect. It's not ready yet. People still value people. No one picks up an avocado and asks whether a machine or an animal tilled the ground to get it. They just look at the avocado. But this doesn't mean just drop everything and say your skills are invaluable. Keep doing your work. The choice isn't between picking machine or human. It's about merging the best of both to create something extraordinary. And we can be the leaders that direct this change if we choose to be. Thanks for watching.
Catch you next video.